Thank you, Bertrand. I'm going to talk about adding in more uh, therapies which will poison the patients even more in the medical sense, but possibly help in the cancer-related sense. Um, we have uh, seen this uh, in uh, presentations earlier on today. Uh, this is from Stampede. This is the uh, um, control arm of the metastatic patients. And what this uh, shows us, um, rather soberingly, uh, is that we really don't do that well with our patients with standard ADT. Um, half of the patients failing within uh, a year, and about 60% of the patients overall dying uh, within that time. And when we look at the substratification of these patients, um, where we can see uh, lymph node-only disease here, bone-only disease here, and the combination, these patients are dying fairly quickly, notwithstanding the best available medical treatment. We do rather better in uh, M0, uh, and this is um, one of the conundrums of the difference in the natural history of these two and, reflection, and a reflection of the biology. Um, this is, uh, again, stampede control arm M0 uh, with biochemical failure here, 50% at, uh, at uh, five years, and mortality here, about one in five dying from the disease. So we have uh, moved on quite a way here, and I'm glad to say that we've got uh, level one data from a number of trials, but we started off with a conflict. Uh, this was uh, the uh, JETUG-15 uh, and charted conflict, where we had a combination of two trials, both were done by expert groups, both done in a, in a well-governed manner, but with conflicting data. The JETUG-15 study design, randomization to ADT and dose taxol given for nine cycles, uh, supplemented just uh, shortly after the start with... Uh, uh, GCSF, um, 385 patients, and charted a bigger study, took longer to recruit, uh, with a substratification of a high and low metastatic uh, volume, we've talked about that, I won't go into it, um, with six cycles of ADT versus ADT alone. And the primary endpoint was survival. Here's the JETUG-15 data, no significant difference, although some suggestion of a separation in the curves at this uh, two and a half to three year time point. Charted a clear and large substantial difference with a hazard ratio of 0.61. So that left the world in a something of a dilemma. North America tended to go with charted. Europe tended to stay with the uncertainty principle until we managed to get to publish uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, stampede data based on the addition of dostaxel zoledronic acid and having first published the data on celecoxib. So just to remind you of the inclusion criteria, these were predominantly, um, well, these were all high risk, predominantly metastatic 60% and about 40% were M0. Uh, with the main end point of survival, patients were predominantly performance status zero and one. We had a small proportion of, zero, of, of twos. Um, and our secondary outcome measures compound of failure-free survival. This was the first of PSA progression, new disease in bone, symptomatic treatment, uh, and toxicity. Now, you've seen this slide many times now, um, and I, I won't explain the details of the, of the trial and its structure, which is a bit unusual, um, but suffice to say, we started planning this in about 2002, started in 2005, and had recruited um, in 2012 to this first tranche, where we had stopped the recruitment of the celecoxib-containing arms, but uh, went on with the uh, dostaxel and zoledronic acid arms. This was the final number of accrual. Um, a number of patients in the uh, standard of care, just under 1,200, and just under 600 in each of the, the uh, other intervention arms. As I've said, the majority of the patients were uh, performance status uh, one and two, Median age 65, so somewhat under the average age of presentation of prostate cancer, but uh, most of the patients, uh, about just over, uh, uh, oh, just under two, uh, two thirds, had metastases, and most of these had bony meds at first presentation, predominantly treated with GnRH analogs. A clear difference in failure free survival um, with a big hazard ratio, 0.62. Uh, at this 24-36 uh, uh, month time point. And when we looked at survival, again, this is taking into account these are M0s and M1s. Um, once again, 
a clear improvement in overall survival. Hazard ratio there of 0.76 uh, and uh, an 11 month just about uh, improvement. We had a pre-planned analysis uh, for the metastatic patients and uh, this showed that the predominant benefit was in those patients who had met metastases at first presentation with a really substantial improvement uh, in the overall survival of these patients, showing clearly uh, that the addition of dose taxol, uh, but not the addition of zoledronic acid, uh, was improved. And if you look at the forest plot here, you can see the reason why um, the M1s are driving the result overall. So a, a very large shift um, to the advantage of the uh, equivalence line, but no real difference in the m noughts. But there are some clear things which you should note. One is the width of the confidence intervals here, and that's because the event rate here at 93 out of just under 700 patients is really not enough yet. So this bit of the trial has not yet reached its um, event rate, um, uh, and it's not sufficiently powerful, but it may be in the future. There were adverse events, mostly related to the um, uh, endocrine treatment, but significantly we did find that neutropenic sepsis ran at about 12%. Uh, this was very well managed on the whole, it was expected, and when we reanalyzed uh, uh, one year down the line, we uh, uh, showed that there was a return to baseline, and these side effects were predominantly related to the endocrine manipulation associated with the treatment. So conclusions, definite improvement in survival for hormone-naive prostate cancer, and that this was in the metastatic, with a rider that there may be some improvement uh, overall in men who are M0, but we haven't got maturity in the data yet. And this really fits with what we also know from Jetwig 12, which was published in 2015 in Lancet Oncology. This again is in the M0 uh, category of patients with a very similar um, um, separation in the curves, this is a relapse-free survival, uh, but no statistical difference when it came to overall survival on a smaller number of patients. Now, um, we've been able to put together the data, and Karim showed you a little bit of this uh, earlier on, uh, in a pre-planned analysis. This is a coordinated effort between the Jetug teams, the charted teams, and uh, the stampede teams who'd met beforehand and arranged so that we could put all this data together. Uh, so this is what we have for m noughts, and this was run by the MRC Clinical Trials Unit. Um, the predominant driver was uh, these three trials, which had 12, RTOG0521 and Stampede. We had 2,100 men just over, representing 51% of all the men randomized in trials of this type. Um, the format was pretty similar, estromustine in some, uh, mainly uh, straightforward dose taxol in others. And the results uh, with the event rate a little higher because the RTOG uh, trial is much more mature. Uh, and again, what we can see when we look at failure-free um, is uh, there's a, a clear improvement with an 8% absolute reduction in failure-free survival. But when we look at the deaths where we are not mature enough really to make a pronouncement uh, uh, as reflected in the wide confidence intervals of the stampede part of the study, a 5% improvement overall. This will be reanalyzed further down the line to see what the overall effect is uh, in the M0 patients. And I suspect that there will be patients who do benefit when we look at the sub-analyses. In M1, this is really quite strong data now. Uh, we have five trials, 3,200 men in the meta-analysis, Jetug 15 charted and stampede. So we have 93% of all randomized patients uh, for analysis. Um, we know what the format is. Um, the event rate is very high, so this data is pretty solid and as good as I think we could expect in this area. And there is no doubt that dose taxol added to this group of patients results in benefit for the patients. And that is the size of the benefit when we look at failure free survival 15% 15 absolute reduction at four years. And similarly, with the survival overall, about a 10% absolute improvement. We haven't yet resolved this issue of the high volume, low volume thing. We had a, a discussion on it earlier on. In uh, Charted, there seems to be a difference. Uh, in Jetug, even with a reanalysis of the data from the 385 patients, no difference. 
We're currently reanalyzing the stampede uh, data, looking at uh, the number of bone mets. We will also look at uh, lymph node mets only and see what effect that has. And I hope that we'll have that completed within the year. We have a team working on it currently. Where are we going next? Because the standard of care has changed. And this is reflected um, in these um, uh, studies. And this is a sample, not by any means a, a comprehensive sample, of the sort of thinking uh, which is happening at the moment, uh, which is we have a, a series of trials which have started looking at ADT plus, so ADT plus abiraterone, ADT plus ARN flavonoid 9, um, Bayer have got a suite of trials, Stellas have got a suite of trials, we have the academic groups such as PEACE and so on. And again, all this may change when we start to report on the other trials which are following through, such like uh, trials such as the PEACE trial. I'm going to give you the example of Stampede because we haven't got too much time, you need some coffee. Uh, but suffice to say that Stampede has moved on uh, with its additional arms. So the control arm had remained the same until uh, the publication of the dose taxal data. This has now changed, but we've recruited 1,900 patients in the Abiraterone study, uh, which will report next year, hopefully concurrently with the PEACE uh, study, which, uh, with the, um, which is to look at the addition of Abiraterone to standard ADT. Uh, we've now recruited just about 2,000 patients looking at ADT plus radiotherapy to the primary site um, uh, in metastatic disease. The event rate there will be pretty quick, and I think that that will report fairly soon. And we've re recruited just under 2,000 patients to the ADT and combination abiraterone and enzalutamide arms. We've started to recruit to the metformin study. Um, this is both in M0 and M1. We expect that this will uh, go fairly quickly. The recruitment so far has been very promising. And uh, we will see really how this is affecting not only cancer survival, because we've got a, a, a double end point in this. One is cancer survival. The second is the mitigation of cardiovascular events or, or effects from androgen deprivation, because we know that as soon as we switch off the androgens, as you've just heard, then there are major changes in uh, glucose, in lipids, in hypertension, uh, and so on, uh, which we will see uh, uh, are, are affected positively by the addition of metformin. This is where we are with Stampede at the moment. We have currently 8,600 patients recruited into this trial, and uh, we're going with metformin. Uh, we have a planning stage for a number of other trials. Thanks very much. <laughs>